So in our last session, we talked about animal agriculture, which is really just one special case of a more general sort of a scenario, which are animals that are caught up somehow in human culture. This video is going to be about um, broader questions about how animals relate to human culture. We're going to be talking about a piece that we read by Donna Haraway and another one that we read by Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka. Let's start with Donna Haraway. That's Haraway there on the right and her dog Cayenne on the left. Donna Haraway is interested generally in the sorts of hybrids that occur at the boundaries between categories, and in this reading she's focused on the blurring of boundaries between species. Unlike some of the authors that we've read, she's not really making many explicit moral claims or arguments, but more showing us a picture of what's possible in relationships between species, particularly, but not exclusively, between humans and non-humans. To the extent that there are tacit moral arguments in play in her writing on interspecies relationships, Haraway is working within a very different sort of moral framework than the ones that we've seen and talked about. Her focus on specific relationships between specific beings and the interdependent flavor of those relationships evokes themes that are typically found in care ethics. Care ethics represents a relatively recent addition to philosophy's moral conceptual tools, going back to the early 1980s for some of the founding texts of this movement. Arising out of a feminist critique of about 2,000 or more years of male-dominated moral philosophy that's focused on the independence of individuals and dispassionate, disinterested, abstract rules of conduct, early care ethicists sought to direct attention towards the relationships that are found in the home rather than in the marketplace. In these relationships, exemplified in the sort of care labor that's historically been done by women and ignored by men, people aren't independent of one another, but are dependent on one another and vulnerable to one another. These relationships, characterized by vulnerability and obligations of care, are deeply personal and they're not disinterested at all. Relationships with obligations of care are thick, so to speak, and they require a lot of time and effort to build up. Often, care ethicists will argue for special obligations that exist on the basis of past relationships and interactions. In some of its less radical forms, this can sometimes look like a virtue theory with a feminist correction to a history of exclusively masculinist perspectives, where the virtues that enable us to build up caring relationships are being given their due attention. Independence from one another isn't held up as an ideal so much as dismissed as unrealistic in exchange for the recognition that we're all interdependently vulnerable and responsible to those that we interact with. In more radical forms, care ethics pushes for a kind of an ontological shift away from a focus on individuals as the primary unit of moral consideration and towards relationships as the crucial entity that moral reasoning is concerned with. Now, the central example that Haraway is exploring in this chapter is her own relationship with her dog, Cayenne, with whom she is a research partner as well as a partner in agility sports. And we can see those shades of a care framework when she emphasizes the ways in which both she and her dog are not only mutually enriched in these partnerships, but mutually co-constituted. Haraway and Cayenne literally are what they are in part because of the ways in which each has tuned and adjusted themselves in a dance of agency that is strangely both in and not in their own control. In fact, the process of domestication generally, while usually thought of as something that humans have done to non-human animals, is actually a mutually co-constituting process that has shaped both the human and non-human poles of these relationships that domestication is built out of. It is... As Haraway says, quoting Vinciane Despre, an anthropozoogenetic practice. Haraway laments that domestication is sometimes seen as an evil amongst some animal advocates and offers a suggestion that while it has frequently been catastrophic for these animals, when we can look at factory farming for one great example of that, it need not be. There are reprehensible human non human relationships, and there are beautiful ones. And the difference between the two seems to be the extent to which humans see these relationships as an opportunity to bend animals to their own will and to the needs of humans versus as an opportunity for a mutually beneficial co-constitutive tuning. We can have good relationships, at least with some animals, but we have to do so in such a way that regards them as a significant capital O other who has an affective influence on us and calls us to be responsive and responsible to them. We have to meet each other halfway. 
we can see in this image that the dog trainer has come down to her knees on the ground at the dog's level. That's a, like one really easy example of how uh, in an interaction with a dog you might meet them halfway to actually come down to their level. This works great with small children as well. This halfway place where humans and non-humans meet, interact, and influence one another is what Haraway calls the contact zone, a term that she's borrowing from sociology to refer to the improvised pigeon languages and hybrid cultural practices that tend to pop up when distinct human cultures meet. The big lesson learned from agility training, as Haraway tells it, is that she cannot simply be the boss and enforce her own will on Cayenne. Crucial to the way that she and Cayenne navigate this contact zone is a positive reinforcement behaviorist approach to training, in which desired behaviors are captured and rewarded when voluntarily performed. As Haraway points out, this approach requires that the human trainer must respond to the authority of the dog's actual performance. If you've ever done any positive reinforcement behaviorist training with a dog, you'll know that a dog who has learned some tricks wants to show you what they know. They want to train. They see it, when it works, as a fun game. And crucial to keeping it a fun game that everyone wants to play is the human recognizing that this is as much about shaping their own behavior as the dog's behavior. The human trainer finds themselves wondering, what is she thinking? What can I do to cue the behavior that we're trying to learn? What can I do to capture it when she performs it? And when the game breaks down in frustration, both the human and the dog are frustrated. When it clicks, both the human and the dog get a dopamine rush. Both walk away from the experience changed and bonded to the other from this activity that is essentially an attempt to understand what the other wants. An I pay attention to you, you pay attention to me game. Good training and good interactions, whether between humans and non-humans, or humans and other humans for that matter, isn't about domination. It's about collaboration on a common project and the trust that this both requires and produces. And in play, that common project is often the source of spontaneous and unexpected developments, if only we can remain available to them, rather than caught up in our own ideas about how free play is supposed to unfold. It's about getting into muddles and then coming out on the other side, as the philosopher Greg Bateson and his daughter discuss in their playful dialogues about play. And importantly for interspecies play, this doesn't require language. We all know full well when an animal wants to play with us. We don't need language for that, and we don't need formal rules. We just need to be willing to see where it goes, willing to get into muddles and then come out the other side. And when we do that, two players can become one team, one relationship, one hybrid entity that isn't me and you, but us. This sort of interaction is fragile, and it can evaporate as quickly and unexpectedly as it comes on, but it's joyous, and both humans and animals alike can't help but chase it once we've gotten a taste of it. If Haraway is to be believed, we have something important to learn from interactions with non-human animals, particularly the thick kinds of relationships that have lots of history built on care and spontaneous play. I'll confess that my own relationship with my dog Callaloo is one that I found significantly enriched by looking at it through a Harrowayan lens, and I like to think that both she, Callaloo, and I are better for this. We enrich each other's ignorance, to borrow a quote from Donna Haraway. Now, it might be objected that the grounds for this sort of interspecies connection is fairly rare. Dogs and other domesticated animals, like horses, who are a great example of the kinds of relationships that can be built up between humans and non-humans, um, who have co-evolved with humans to form a shared nature culture, are kind of an exception rather than the rule in the animal kingdom. This might be true, but it should also be noted that exceptionally good behaviorists, like Karen Pryor, have had success with positive reinforcement training for all sorts of wild animals, including ones that aren't all that naturally social, although finding naturally social behaviors in an animal species certainly helps us build up thick relationships with them. Furthermore, plenty of interspecies animal friendships spontaneously arise without any human intervention at all. We can add to this the recognition that virtually all of the species that we are currently keeping in factory farm conditions are clearly capable of relationships that are based on mutual affection rather than callous domination and consumption. It's also worth noting that we've only recently begun to think of interspecies relationships in anything other than a framework of domination and subjugation, and the sorts of interspecies relationships that are in question here take a whole lot of time to build, even evolutionary scale durations of time. Perhaps another sort of world with other sorts of human-non-human -human relationships is possible, and the best sorts of pet relationships, the sorts that we might call companion species, point us in that direction. At the very least, 
The capacity for interspecies friendship appears to be just as hardwired into both humans and non-human animals as the capacity for predation and domination seems to be. But perhaps Haraway's depiction of the rich potential to be found in interspecies friendships is only one kind of human-non-human relationship. Perhaps my relationship with, say, an endangered snow leopard ought not be one where I say, let's domesticate and become significant others to each other, but rather one in which my primary obligation to the snow leopard is to leave it alone. Sure, pets are family, and oftentimes functioning members of human society, but wild animals? That's a completely different story, with completely different moral obligations. Here, Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka can offer us some remarkably useful tools. In the introduction to their book Zoopolis, they seem to lay out a slightly more nuanced version of the various kinds of relationships that non-human animals can have with humans and human culture. Their model is more political than moral, though the two inquiries certainly have plenty of overlap, and they encourage us to think of our relationships and obligations to non-human animals through political analogies. Now, this approach is primarily motivated by what they see as a failure of other approaches, such as a welfare or uh, the way that animal rights theories have historically uh, oriented themselves. While animal advocacy groups have grown, and while conceptual progress has certainly broadened the scope of the sorts of moral obligations that we might consider that we might have towards animals, the facts on the ground are that the human population keeps growing, and the number of animals subjected to unjustifiable harm has grown along with it, as more and more humans are eating more and more meat, and with production demands being met with more shifts towards inhumane factory farming practices. Furthermore, the habitats of wild animals have shrunk as well, along with their numbers. Wild animal populations have dropped by a third since the 1960s. And perhaps worse than all of this, the minimal gains that we've made with respect to animal welfare and animal rights might give us a false sense of security that things are getting better if we can't properly contextualize that against the backdrop of larger trends. These marginal improvements to the conditions that farm animals are kept in can kind of served to cast a veneer of legitimacy over otherwise immoral practices. Donaldson and Kimlicka dropped this chilling phrase, eternal Treblinka, invoking images of the Nazi death camp as an analogy for the industrial scale slaughtering machine that is the global meat market. So long story short here, neither a welfarist approach nor a rights-based approach, or even more recent ecological approaches, seem to have generated the necessary fundamental changes in human practices regarding animals that Donaldson and Kimlicka think are necessary. And they think, therefore, it's time to try something new and different. Donaldson and Kimlicka are coming loosely from a rights-based approach, particularly in the way that they seem to be keen to reject a moral hierarchy that uh, is typical in welfarist approaches, uh, that places human needs and desires over non-human ones. We discussed this amply in our last video about animal agriculture, and we sometimes do see it in animal rights approaches, like, uh, for example, what we saw in Tom Reagan's deployment of a least harm principle, when we get in a position where we have to deal with a scenario where harm to some individual is unavoidable. To the extent that rights-based approaches have offered serious protection for non-human animals that places them on genuinely equal moral footing with humans, these styles of animal rights theories have been politically marginalized. The big problem Donaldson and Kimlicka say here is that animal rights approaches have historically, following this path that's blazed by the tradition of human rights, focused on negative rights. Negative rights, as opposed to positive rights, offer freedom from interference, and place negative duties on others to refrain from certain actions. Consider the usual interpretation of a right to life that protects you from being murdered, but it does not necessarily demand that anyone engage in any kind of positive behavior to save your life, for example, donating a vital organ. This is a negative right, and it places a negative duty upon us to not murder you, or even to carelessly put your life at risk but it doesn't place any positive duties upon us. In order to have positive duties, we would need to have a positive right. And most positive rights in contemporary contexts place positive duties on government really more than private citizens. Examples of these include the right to public education, and maybe more recently um, there's been serious discussion of a universal right to health care. In order for a theory of animal rights to prescribe positive duties, it's going to have to get political, and that's what Donaldson and Kimlicka are here to do. 
Unlike negative obligations to respect universal rights to liberty, when we think of our positive obligations to other humans, it seems natural and perhaps even correct to note that these obligations vary according to the kinds of relationships that we have with others. For example, my positive obligations to my wife are more demanding than my positive obligations to my next door neighbor, which are in turn probably more demanding than my obligations to a stranger who's living on the other side of Greensboro, uh, which is also in turn more demanding than my obligations to some random American citizen, which is also is more demanding than my positive obligations to foreigners with whom I don't share a government. The kinds of interactions that are involved in each of these different kinds of relationships produce different kinds of positive obligations. We've seen this idea before. We saw it recently with Jeff McMahon uh, when he touched on this notion that we might have special obligations that come from past actions, like having caused an animal that's incapable of surviving in the wild uh, to come into being. We might also think much further back in the semester to earlier conversations that we had about justice, in which we noted that it seems like we might have special positive obligations to clean up a mess or fix a problem if we're part of the reason for why that problem exists. So what kinds of relationships do we have with non-human animals, and how do those map onto our intuitions about the kinds of political obligations that we have towards humans? Now it's tempting, and not unusual in animal rights theory circles, to think that all of our interactions with animals are necessarily exploitative, and that our only real obligations toward non-human animals is the negative obligation to leave them alone and not interfere with them. Now hopefully Haraway has given us some good reason to be suspicious of such a claim. If not, Perhaps it's enough to recognize that completely separating ourselves from all non-human animals such that we don't interact with them at all is not only impossible, but seemingly foolish to even try to aim at. Still, this attitude does seem to fit well with our obligations to wild animals in a way that mirrors our obligations to, for example, other countries. In both cases, we have a bare minimal sort of relationship with these individuals, with virtually no direct interaction with them. In both cases, the prevailing intuition is that first and foremost, we have a negative obligation to not interfere with these folks. And only if we fail to do this and cause some kind of harm to them, do we have any positive obligations to intervene and remedy that harm. Now, there might be a slight complication with this analogy in that many wild animals are not outside of our national borders, but within our national borders, unlike most other foreign nations. But we do have a good analogy in the sovereign nations of indigenous peoples who live within U.S. borders. But there are plenty of other animals that we cannot avoid interacting with, and it seems like these demand other sorts of obligations. The strongest sorts of these relationships concern those animals which are fully integrated into human society, like pets and livestock. These species are incapable of surviving on their own in the wild because of their history of interaction with humans. We cannot just leave them to fend for themselves because we are responsible for their inability to do so. The political category for humans that seems most analogous to this is the category of fellow citizenship, which includes all of those humans who are fully and formally integrated into our society and with whom we have fully interdependent social entanglements and social contracts. In many ways, we already perform these sorts of analogies with some animals, uh, the analogy of treating them as if they are full-blown citizens. Consider pets, especially those uh, who have jobs that contribute to human society. Scratch that. Not a human society, but a shared human-non-human society. We tend to think of pets as family members, and it's notable that the American Kennel Society certification of basic training for dogs is called the Canine Good Citizen Test. Following Donna Haraway's analysis, we can see that there are already lots of really good models for the sorts of healthy relationships with positive obligations that we can have with non-human animals that we've intimately bonded with. However, we might need to be wary of how much work we're asking sentimental attachment to an animal to do, because there are lots of other animals who are fully integrated into human culture whose treatment is nothing like the sort of treatment that fellow citizens are owed. Most obvious of these is the eternal treblinka of the factory farm, which looks more like slavery, or perhaps something even worse than slavery, than it looks like citizenship. This should be a clear sign that such treatment of these kinds of animals is way off the mark. We don't directly interact with these animals while they're alive in ways that could produce the kinds of sentimental attachments that we have towards pets, and it seems like that might even be by design. But nonetheless, 
these animals are no less a part of our human culture and society than pets are. It seems to be a strange sort of speciesism that arbitrarily picks some of these animals as near citizens and others as doomed to torture and slaughter. And if you think that it's only the killing part that makes this wrong, consider the strong analogies that get put forth by eco-feminist thinkers like Carol Adams that compare the production of milk and eggs to the sexual violence and slavery that's imposed on human women. Somewhere between the independent sovereignty of wild animals and the quasi-citizenship of pets and other domesticated animals lies a rich continuum of animals that are what Donaldson and Kimlicka call liminal denizens, partially interacting with humans and partially independent at the frontiers between human culture and wilderness. These include animals like pigeons and squirrels and raccoons and foxes, geese, and pollinator insects and countless other species including Davis's Animals of the Field. We might ask ourselves, what kinds of relationships do we have with these animals, and what kinds of political analogies do we have with that kind of relationship? Will Donaldson and Kimlicka direct our attention to non-citizen residents for an answer to this question? That is to say, people who don't have citizenship but are still living within communities, including but not limited to illegal immigration. Now, perhaps this is a dicey analogy to be working with here, as uh, currently, at least, we don't really seem to have figured out a just and humane way to deal with human non-citizen residents, but it's an instructive analogy nonetheless. And clearly, there's a wide range of some kinds of positive obligations that fall somewhere between our obligations to wild animals and our obligations to fully domesticated animals. Perhaps we have some level of positive duty to care for these animals, while also recognizing that they are neither interested in, nor capable, at least as of yet, in being recruited into cooperative citizenship with us. Maybe we should have some level of positive duty to try to create a path to citizenship, so to speak, for those species that seem like they might be ready and willing. Uh, for example, as some hypotheses concerning the ways that we first welcomed a few special wild canids that would eventually become the ancestors of all domesticated dogs into our communities. Maybe we should seriously consider the obligation to feed hungry denizen species, while also carefully considering the wisdom of these practices vis-a-vis -vis the safety of humans and of the animals as well that are concerned or to provide them with medical care when they get sick or injured. These all seem like no-brainer type questions when it comes to pets and other quasi-citizen animals. Of course we should care for them medically, and uh, we should provide food for them, and we should try to bring them into relationships with ourselves and other humans um, when we're talking about pets. But these also seem like arrogant intrusions when it comes to wild animals. But there's this complexity and ambiguity of how we might answer these questions when it comes to denizen species like raccoons and squirrels and pigeons and maybe even bears. And it seems like these ought to be taken up on a case-by-case -case basis. And this gives us an awful lot to think and talk about, and we had some great questions, um, as usual, produced on the focus question discussion board by those who are participating. Um, here's uh, my distilled version of the top four. The first question has to do with the common practice of killing dogs that um, display aggressive behavior, unacceptably aggressive behavior, and asks if it's fair to put these dogs down that have been trained to fight and kill, but not uh, I guess, n not execute, I suppose, the people who trained those dogs. Our second question is fairly timely, um, and asks whether or not medical testing on animals to find a cure or a treatment for the novel coronavirus would be morally permissible, depending on how we answer why or why not. Our third question kind of synthesized a bunch of questions on the discussion board here. Um, um, we can start with uh, kind of a broad question of, are there any circumstances under which a wild animal should be kept in captivity? Um, maybe uh, part of answering that might also touch on this question of whether or not there's any moral difference between pets and zoos. And lastly, and this is kind of a complex question, but what duties do I have towards uh, say, a bird in my backyard. And there are plenty of other variations that we might put on this. I'll uh, write those out more in full in the discussion uh, below this video so you can see what we're talking about. But the, the, the question that was posted on the discussion board focused on uh, a nest of eggs that 
falls out of a tree and the question of whether or not I have an obligation to care for those eggs if they fell out of my tree. And I think we can do a whole lot of other variations on that and ask, okay, so what's my, what kinds of duties, what kind of moral obligations do I have in this kind of scenario? As usual, I look forward to hearing what you guys think about this stuff, and I hope everybody's well.